Peace and mercy from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is the first of seven sermons based on the epistle reading from Hebrews. We start with a bit of introduction and overview of this epistle. The date of writing is before 70 AD. Why? Because the writer describes the Jerusalem temple sacrifices as if they were still in use. The Jerusalem temple was destroyed in 70 AD. If written after 70 AD, the writer's words would have reflected that reality. The author is unknown. He is not one of the eyewitness apostles because he refers to what we have heard in chapter 2, verse 1. Through the ages, people have suggested a number of possibilities. Paul, but Paul claimed to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. Also, the writing style is a Greek, high Greek style as compared to Paul's more common Greek style, so not Paul. Other suggestions include Luke, Barnabas, and Apollos. However, we do not know. The author remains a mystery. The epistle was clearly accepted along with other New Testament writings as early as by Clement, Bishop of Rome, Criteria 96 AD. The epistle is a sermon in exaltation with a brief letter attached. Much of its focus is on the Old Testament. There are two main sections. The first part is chapter 1 through 10, verse 18. This focuses on Jesus' superiority one over the angels, over Moses, over the Old Testament priesthood, over the Old Testament sacrifices. The second main part is chapter 10, verse 19 through 12, verse 29, an exhortation to faithfulness, an invitation to faithfulness, Old Testament examples of faithfulness, the heroes of the faith in chapter 11, <coughs> Jesus is the ultimate example of faithfulness. Warning against disobedience, unfaithfulness, Old Testament examples. So today's reading is part of the section of Jesus' superiority over the angels. But it begins with a warning. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard 
about the salvation of, in Jesus, lest we drift away from it. That's chapter, verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Then comes a comparison. Verse 2 speaks of a message delivered by angels, a reference to angels delivering God's law to Moses, which we read about in Stephen's sermon in Acts 7, verse 18 and 53. Then in verse 3, the writer speaks of such a great salvation as it was declared at first by the Lord Jesus and was attested to us by those who heard the apostles. The rest of today's readings, verses 5 through 13, focus on the founder of salvation, superior to the angels. But in these verses, we read of both states of Christ's life, both humiliation and exaltation. Something we learned about in the explanation part of Luther's small catechism. Humiliation. As man, Christ did not always or fully use or manifest the divine powers and majesty that were communicated to his human nature. This began with the lowly manner of his incarnation, taking on human flesh and conception, continued in the manner of his birth and life, and was completed with his death and burial. Verse 7 Quoting Psalms 8 regarding the Son of Man, the Messiah, true God, in, in human nature. You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. Verse 10, for it was fitting that he, God, should make the founder of their salvation, Jesus, perfect or complete through suffering. All of these teachings us about Christ's humiliation, how he humbled himself, taking on human nature and appearing to be somewhat something other than divine, while he always had all his godly nature and powers. He did not always use or reveal them. We see the purpose of this in the verses after reading, after our reading, verses 14 through 18. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he sees himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through fear of, who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that helps that he helps but he helps the offspring of Adam, Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because of himself has suffered, because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Christ's humiliation for the purpose of helping us to share in flesh and blood. But we also see here the exaltation. Back to the explanation of the small catechism. Jesus, who remains true man, meaning now after his death, manifests the divine attributes communicated to him in his incarnation. His power and majesty are manifested fully and consistently in his victorious descent into hell, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, his present reign at the right hand of God, and his future return for judgment. We call this his state of exaltation. And the exaltation highlights the full in deep sense in which Jesus, as our brother, has been exalted by God the Father over sin, death, and the devil, so that our future in him is secure. The last part of verse 7 and first part of verse 8 tell us this about exaltation. 
You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in sub subjection under his feet. Now putting everything in some subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. So finally, we get to the words of our title, Under His Feet. Under His Feet means Jesus is the victor. In terms of his battle against sin, death, and the devil, Jesus has won. Everything, everything is under his feet. The Greek word for resurrection is anastasis, literally means to stand up. Jesus stands. He has crushed that evil tyranny by his perfect life of obedience and his suffering and dying for the guilt of all sin in the world. Jesus was trampled, Jesus has trampled the power of sin over us by his resurrection. Jesus has trodden, trodden down the power of death over us. And in all this, the promised seed of the woman was crushed has crushed the dead, the head of the serpent, fulfilling the original gospel promise in Genesis 3.15. All this under Jesus' feet, setting us free from sin, death, and the power of the devil. But we notice the problem mentioned in the last part of verse 8. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. We, we still see war and conflict between the nations and hostility and accusations and hatred within nations and communities and families. We still see a natural world out of balance, storms, floods, not the perfection God created. We'll, we still see our own lives struggling with the conflict of the old Adam our sinful nature and desires. Daily we sin much and indeed deserve nothing but punishment from God, both now and forever. The old Adam daily struggles against the new creation, the new life in Christ placed in us by holy baptism. We still recognize that death, physical death, is all about us and awaits our bodies until Jesus comes. But Verse 9, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering and death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Like the writer and readers of Hebrews all those years ago, since we don't yet see the glory and honor crowning Jesus, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. What have we heard? The perfect life of Jesus is complete obedience that counts for us. The death of Jesus, that for us has removed eternal death, eternal separation from God. The resurrection of Jesus that has given us a new spiritual life through holy baptism and the promise that we too will rise from the grave when he comes again. The ascension of Jesus and the message that he now sits on the heavenly throne with his Father, ruling all things in his love for us. All things under his feet, under his control, under the feet of the one who so loved us that he gave himself so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. All things, all things, all things are under the feet of the one who loves us.